let me say, a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. Okay, so then why attachment theory? If that's kind of a little bit of a background for uh, you know, the human person from a theological point of view, why, why use attachment theory? Well, there are several reasons. First of all, as we'll see, this theory gives a primacy of place to the relational dimension of the person. Okay? It's primarily a relational theory of the person. Secondly, it's based on natural science. Okay? Uh, as we'll talk about, John Bowlby was uh, very much uh, uh, devoted to the idea of, of natural science uh, and wanted to base his ideas uh, on something solid, not just airy-fairy theory. And from a Catholic point of view, this is also helpful because uh, all truth leads us back to Christ, right? So science done well should harmonize with our theological and philosophical understanding of the person. All right, and attachment theory uh, has produced a number of prospective longitudinal studies and extensive ins empirical support that I'll talk about. It's also a kind of an integrative theory. It brings together a lot of different dimensions of the person. Cognition, in other words, how we think, emotion, how we feel, behavior, how we act, our relationships with other people, and our bodiliness. All of these things are important parts of, of attachment theory. And as I explored in my dissertation, I think that much of it is compatible with a Catholic anthropology. Now, of course, there are some things that we can be skeptical about, as we should always be, but I think much of it is, is uh, very usable and harmonious with a Catholic view of the person. In my view, attachment is psychology's best answer to the question, how do we learn how to love? In other words, it's, this is psychology's attempt to, to explore that question in more detail, more particularity. You know, what concrete things uh, happen in a family that shapes a person's ability to give and receive love, either for, for better or for worse. And uh, I think attachment theory and, and attachment research has a lot of really interesting and useful things to say about that. So I'd like to uh, kind of give you a little background on attachment theory, uh, because I think it's really useful, and it'll help us understand a lot of the research that I'm going to talk about. So attachment theory was developed by John Bowlby. Uh, who, whose dates are on the slide there, 1907-1990. He was a, uh, a British psychoanalyst. He trained uh, in Britain under Melanie Klein. Melanie Klein was uh, one of the leaders of the psychoanalytic establishment at the time when he was going through his psychiatric training. Anna Freud was one of the other key leaders. And uh, as a, an analyst, uh, he was very much concerned about helping people, helping individuals, helping families, but he had a lot of critical things to say about psychoanalysis in terms of its scientific basis. He questioned uh, much of Freudian theory because it lacked a solid scientific basis. And he felt that psychological theory should be based more on a natural science model. In other words, real experience is important. It's kind of hard for us to, to sort of imagine this now, but in his day, Kleinian psychoanalytic theory really emphasized fantasy life and wish fulfillment and defense mechanisms and things like that much more than real experience. So to a Kleinian analyst in Bowlby's day, what was more important is what goes on in between our ears, the kinds of fantasies that we have, the, the wishes that we have, how we struggle with those wishes and so forth, as opposed to the actual events in our lives and how those things impact us. And so, you know, for instance, um, well, I, I could go on an anecdote, but let's just skip that for time. The point is, is that Bowlby had a, issues with this. He thought that real experience was valuable and important, and we need to take that into account in a way that uh, Klein and her disciples uh, were not doing. So he also took issue with uh, the method that led to psychoanalytic theory, generating psychoanalytic theory. The way psychoanalytic personality theories were, were developed were something like this. Uh, you have an analyst who sees uh, adult patients, learns about them, learns to understand how their personality works, 
learns about their history, and sort of creates a retrospective account of how they came to be this way. Okay, so much of psychoanalytic theory was based on these retrospective accounts from adults of their upbringing and, and you know, how they got to be the, the way they are. So from a scientific point of view, this sort of retrospective account of personality development really doesn't have much merit. It doesn't have much solidity to it. And so he felt that a better way to develop personality theory was to actually observe kids and watch them grow up and uh, study them prospectively as opposed to taking adults and studying retrospectively what their life was like. And this put him at, at odds with the psychoanalytic establishment. Okay, in the uh, 1940s and 50s, Bowlby began to study a phenomenon called maternal deprivation. Uh, as a result of World War II, there were a lot of uh, orphans and uh, other children who were institutionalized for periods of time or sometimes, um, you know, more or less permanently. And there was growing concern about these children and this phenomenon that a few people were calling maternal deprivation. The, uh, again, this may be hard for us to imagine now because so much time has passed and, and cultures and, and customs have changed. But at that, times, uh, at that time, it was not uncommon for young children to un undergo fairly long separations in some cases. For instance, if a uh, mother had, let's say she had a three-year-old and now she's pregnant, she's going to have another child, and she goes to the hospital, uh, she might leave uh, the three-year-old in the hospital nursery uh, to be cared for by a rotating staff uh, while she's having the baby and recuperating and so forth and have uh, little to no contact with, with mother or father during that time. Similarly, if a child, a young child, uh, really a child of any age, went to the hospital maybe for a tonsillectomy or something like that, some kind of procedure, uh, they were allowed one hour of uh, visiting time with their family per week. And that was sort of the norm of uh, the 1950s in England and and I presume many other places as well. Uh, and when Bowlby and some of his colleagues began to protest and say that this is really not good for these kids, they were sort of laughed at and mocked because people could not uh, even comprehend that there was something harmful about this. So one of the things that, that um, he did is, is with a, a colleague, James Robertson, is they conducted some cinematic studies. In other words, they filmed, they took a, a camera, this is 1950, so I'm sure it was a clunky old thing, but they, they took a camera and they videotaped some of these kids going through these separations. And they studied this. They did, I think they published three studies this way. And they showed how distressing these separations were. And they also mapped out the, uh, um, the pattern of distress that kids go through. Uh, and this idea of protest, despair, and detachment was, uh, came from Bowlby's work with, with James Robertson that first there's anxiety and protest, there's the separation distress, eventually that gives way to despair or deep sadness, uh, and eventually to a sense of uh, apathy, you know, kind of giving up on relationship. Um, and this also became the basis for uh, Bowlby's later work on, on grief and loss as well. And because of his work in these two areas, maternal deprivation and, and so forth, he, uh, uh, sorry, because of his work in this area and, and the cinematic studies that they did, uh, he became very influential. The World Health Organization commissioned him to uh, publish a report on their behalf on the dangers of maternal deprivation and uh, hospital policies and uh, orphanage policies and things like that began to change. Okay, one last point uh, is that Bowlby was dissatisfied with um, what he called secondary drive theories of attachment. Okay, what does that mean? It's kind of technical. Well, the idea is that um, you can't deny that there's a bond that occurs between a child and his caretaker, usually the mother, okay? And so psychoanalytic uh, theory, uh, American behaviorist theory, acknowledge that there's a kind of a bond that occurs there. But how they explained that bond was that it was a secondary phenomenon. And that's what he means by secondary drive theory is a secondary thing. It's not primary in its own right. The psychoanalysts uh, said that a child forms a bond with his mother because she gives him pleasure, oral pleasure. So the child then prefers her and wants her around because she gives him pleasure. And it's only later on that the child begins to understand that she's a person too uh, and so forth. And the behaviorist said something similar using different words that 
that the child begins to prefer the mother because she reinforces him. She gives him positive reinforcement. She smiles. She talks to him. She responds to his cries. She feeds him. And so the bond that occurs is really a secondary phenomenon based on something prior, like food or, or uh, oral pleasure or something like that. And Bowlby was dissatisfied with this. So he went on a search uh, for uh, scientific evidence to help him ground his theory. He was looking for something in the, the natural sciences, and he came to ethology. Ethology is the study of human, or sorry, animal behavior. And one of the people that he came across was Con Conrad Lorenz. Is anybody familiar with Lorenz? You might see him in a sidebar in your Psych 100 textbook or something like that. He studied geese and other waterfowl and discovered um, the phenomenon of imprinting. Basically, imprinting um, occurs shortly after a, a, a goose hatches or a gosling hatches. They look for some moving object in their environment. And whatever they encounter, some moving object, they will form a bond, they will imprint on that object, and they will begin to follow it. And they will follow it very, very persistently. And Lorenz did these studies where he would take these goslings and he would take the eggs and he would hatch them apart from the mother and uh, see what would happen. And they would hatch and, well, what happened? They imprinted on Lorenz. So there's old video. You can actually find this on YouTube if you search enough for it. Uh, I found one once that had a Spanish um, you know, uh, voiceover, which is weird because Lorenz was German. But anyway, uh, <laughs> you see Lorenz walking all around his, his place with these goslings following him, and he could not get them to stop. Uh, whatever he did, they wanted to be right next to him, and they would protest if he tried to separate them. And when he mixed them with other goths, goslings and with the biological mother, they would very quickly segregate out to be with him as opposed to being with the other geese. And this is not dependent on food or anything else. So Bowlby seized on to this because here we have evidence in the animal literature of an instinct to bond with another that's not dependent on food or other reinforcement. Okay? Now, also pivotal for him was the work of Harry Harlow. Harlow was also an ethologist who studied rhesus monkeys. Um, again, you might come across his work and your you know, intro to psych textbook or something like that. He did a number of fascinating studies uh, with rhesus monkeys where he would separate them from their mothers at birth, rear them in isolation, or rear them uh, with a group of peers, or rear them with uh, a surrogate mother. And the surrogates that he used were not actual live mothers. They were basically um, an inanimate object, like a doll dressed up to be like a monkey. Okay? And in one of his most famous renditions of this study, he gave uh, the rhesus monkeys a choice between two mothers, two surrogate mothers. One was just a, a wire structure, like a, you know, a cold kind of wire structure with a face on it. The other was identical, but it was coated in soft brown terry cloth, so it was soft and cuddly. Okay? Well, the monkeys would prefer the soft terry cloth one every time. Well, what if you hook up a feeding apparatus to the wire mother so that they always get food from the wire surrogate? never from the cloth surrogate. And what happened was the monkeys still preferred the cloth surrogate every time. And they would cling to the cloth surrogate um, sometimes up to 20 hours a day and only go over to the wire surrogate to feed for short bursts and then go back to clinging on to the, the soft terry cloth mother. So again, this gave Bowlby something solid to stand on, something from the animal literature showing that here in another primate we have an instinct to form a bond that's not dependent on food. In fact, it's really, in this case, the, the, the mother's not really doing anything. It's just soft and available. And that's all these little monkeys need. They want something soft and available to cling on to. And it helped them feel more secure. Harlow even tried to punish the monkeys to see if he could sort of break this bond, you know, to see if he could uh, manipulate it that way. So in one, another rendition of his studies, he rigged up an apparatus where uh, the monkeys would be holding on to the, the, the terry cloth mother, and a little light would go off. And once the light went off, then the monkeys would be hit with a, a strong blast of compressed air. Now, this is a very aversive stimulus for a little rhesus monkey, very scary and uncomfortable. So the idea was that through a kind of classical conditioning uh, paradigm, they would begin to see the light, anticipate that the blast is coming, and let go of the cloth mother and, and get out of there. But that's not what happened. What happened was that uh, when the light would come on, they would cling tighter, right? 
And Harlow, uh, he said about this, the way he interpreted this was that um, anything threatening intensifies attachment behavior. It doesn't extinguish it, okay? So this kind of, you know, was sort of going against the behaviorist paradigm to a certain extent, um, but also was great uh, food for, for Bowlby as he was developing his theory. Okay. So some of the basic points of Bowlby's attachment theory, which he developed, and he wrote a trilogy of books laying this out, uh, the Attachment and Loss Trilogy, uh, and he began publishing those around 1960, and that uh, continued up through the, the 70s. I think the last volume was published right around either 78 or 80, something like that, uh, this trilogy of books. And they're still in print, and they're phenomenal. So one of his basic ideas is that there's a basic instinct toward relatedness. It's not secondary upon anything else. It's basic. In other words, we have an instinct to form a relationship, and that's fundamental to who we are. And in his sort of scientific way of trying to explain this, he borrowed a lot of language from ethology uh, and evolutionary theory. And he talked about the attachment behavioral system. That's kind of technical verbiage for basically an idea of an instinct. That we have an instinct, we come into the world with this instinct to form a bond to our caregiver. Uh, it's not dependent on food or other reinforcement. It's present from basically from birth. Uh, it strongly emerges in the second half of the first year of life. He talked about the set goal of this attachment instinct as maintaining the caregiver's accessibility and responsiveness. Now he's talking about the, the, the attachment instinct in humans now. It looks a little different in different species, but for humans, the goal is to maintain our caregiver's accessibility and responsiveness. We need that in order to survive infancy, and we need that in order to feel secure. And in some way, that remains with us throughout life, as we'll talk about. This attachment instinct is triggered by danger, uh, basically anything that threatens us, as Harlow talked about, illness, fatigue, uh, separation from our caregivers, um, things like that. So when these situations occur, it triggers our attachment instinct and, and it makes us feel and, and inclines us to do certain things to restore uh, a sense of security. It aids in our survival by providing protection. As you know, an infant is pretty helpless. And um, if you think back to, you know, sort of what we imagine our evolutionary history to be when maybe you know, a few hundreds or thousands of years ago, we're living in a, in a kind of a, uh, you know, a more wilderness type of environment. Uh, human infants were subject to predation, and the need for uh, adults to be protective and to be responsive to them was essential for their survival, not just to feed them, but to protect them from danger. Mm -hmm.